Welcome to So and So, brought to you by Bernina, made to create. I'm Meg Goodman, and you're about to enjoy a casual conversation with a special member of the sewist and quilting community. A conversation about how they got started, what inspires them, what excites them, and their connection to this community. Our guest today is Michael C. Thorpe a visual artist with a primary focus in textiles who lives and works out of New York City. Through the use of bright colors, organic shapes, and meandering quilting patterns, he explores the limitations of both social constructs and textiles. He combines fabrics, imagery, and language to evoke alternative perspectives on the human experience. Michael grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, and graduated from Emerson College with a degree in photojournalism. He was also a student athlete as a member of their basketball team. In February of 2020, Michael opened his breakthrough exhibition at All Too Human, a high fashion boutique located on Newberry Street in Boston. It received critical and favorable response from the Boston art community and the public alike. And a work was acquired for the Museum of Fine Art Boston's permanent collection. Hello, Michael, and welcome to So and So. Hello, Meg. That was a wonderful um, introduction. Thank you. Well, you you have uh, wonderful stories to tell us, and we're we're looking forward to hearing all about so many things you have to share with us today. You know, you you very quickly, Michael, became a, an incredibly accomplished artist. But take us back to the beginning and tell us how you learned to quilt and sew. Um, Yeah, so the beginning of my quilting story goes all the way back to 2004, actually. And I entered like a competition. um, And I don't really recall actually making the quilt because it was funny uh, when I started quilting again seriously. Um, back in 2018, my mother like jokingly was like, Oh, we want to see your first quilt. And I was like, mom, it's right there. I just did it. And unbeknownst to me, she goes into the closet and pulls out this really old, like aquarium scene. And it was dated 2004. And then it did remind me that I had made a quilt long time ago. So what, how did you learn to, to, to do this? Well, where did you pick up your sewing and quilting techniques? So I was, I'm very fortunate to have a mother that has been quilting her entire life. And when I was like in flux with my artistic practices, I ended up looking towards her and seeing what she was doing. And now finally seeing it in the artistic light it deserves Uh, I started learning from her. She taught me very quickly all the ins and outs of quilting. And I was so fortunate on top of that to have an aunt, her sister, who owns a quilt shop. So I got quickly immersed in the quilting world. Now, Michael, your mom, speaking of your mom, has said that your work is shaped by your identity. And I'm going to quote her here. She said, one day he created a self-portrait, which will be proudly displayed in my home. And that was the start of this whole thing. So tell us more about your identity's influence on your work. Yeah, um, that's so interesting for me to think about because when I think about art, like I really gravitate to artists. And I think most artists do the same thing, but I really gravitate towards artists that are saying, telling their story or telling their perspective of the world. And when I started quilting, I noticed it was very like regimented. You know, you had a pattern, here's all the fabrics, here's the quilting pattern, and you make it and you make it just like everybody else. And that was so fascinating to me because I saw the limit, I mean, the the no limitations of quilting very early on. And I wanted to just create anything I saw. And the way I saw the world um, quickly shaped the way I started to quilt and building off the foundation of photography that I learned in college and then going to more figurative works, I really ended up making these really interesting and I didn't at the time didn't know quite different quilts to like the mainstream. 
talk about uh, you, you talk about photojournalism. You, you talk about um, the photography you did. Uh, your your degree from Emerson was in this. Uh, what influence does photography have on on your works and your art? So photography's taught me how to see the world, um, especially when you think about the quilts that I make that are very flat, two dimensional. Um, there's no shadows. I don't use like different tones to like emphasize shadows. And I started to notice that when I would see something that I like, I would draw it. And usually when I was drawing them, I would be looking at a photograph. Most of the time, a photograph I took, but other time it was just source material. But I realized that since the photos were so flat, it was easy to draw. Michael, you've also talked about Romari Bearden and Jacob Lawrence's abstract of Black life uh, having had an impact on your art. Tell us more about these individuals and their influence on you. Yeah, so they were one, they were one of those first artists that I saw that I uh, identified with aesthetically, like their work very much influenced my work, um, where they use very uh, flat figures. They use very, uh, uh, excuse me, they use shapes to make faces and stuff. And it's like a collage process. Mm -hmm. Romari Bearden is a collage artist and then Jacob Lawrence is a painter. And so seeing those works for the first time really made me believe that one, the track that I was going on the right track because you had these influences. And then two, it really encouraged me to continue making abstracts of my daily life because that's all they were doing. They weren't doing anything sensationalized or anything super dramatic. It was pretty mundane scenes. And that's when I really understood that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to just make the world I see, you know, and it's ever changing. Um, but to start out and to go on, it's just one of those interesting things. I have a piece in my upcoming show that's literally just a still life of me drinking coffee in the morning. And I just think of how beautiful that is of, of being able to depict anything you see. Michael, you talk about the freedom of not saying no. And this has really seemed to guide you through your art and the many facets of your life. How so? Yeah, so that is a very big thing that I think about all the time when making art. Um, I never want to have a hesitancy of being like, oh, should I make it because of X, Y, and Z? I think of it more as I'm the artist and I want to make everything and anything. And having a medium like quilting, I think of it as like this in my paintbrush. And as we all know, there's everything has been done in paint pretty much. Every f abstract, figurative, minimalist, all of that. And that's kind of the way I approach quilting, you know, at the age of 27, you know, I always keep saying I haven't even had an art career and looking down the road, I want to be at the end of the day, look at it and be like, wow, I tried it all. I did it all. And I think that is a big freedom that I continue to take with me. And I hope I never have to say no to it. Michael, your aunt, who you mentioned earlier, has a fabric shop in New Hampshire where you found your love of batik fabric. And there are also people you've talked about who send fabric to you. Um, how do these fabrics help you tell your stories? And, and maybe tell us about some of the fabric that you've received from people. Yeah. When I think of quilting specifically, I think of, one, the historical community-based activity it was, and now seeing like my people at my aunt's quilt shop, how it still is very much a community activity. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, my work is pretty isolated. I have a coworker and that's about it. But pretty all of my materials, fabric and thread have come from other people. And I think about how that act is still based in the community aspect of quilting. And every time I make a piece, it is built off of everybody that has helped me get to this point. And I think about it as far back as just growing up. You know, I think everything up until this point of me talking to you has been an influence, has impacted me in some way. And I take that to every part of the quilting where it's each fabric 
I can think of the person that gave it to me. And without that fabric, the work would have, wouldn't have come together. And obviously the primary um, donor or um, I get my fabric is my aunt's quilt shop. And then it turned into this really funny thing where I started doing something at a high level or so passionately that anybody that had any sort of fabric would reach out to me and be like, hey, I have these fabrics. Would you like them? And again, my saying, you never say no because you, you're going to find use for them. And so that's kind of how I've been getting all my um, material to make my work. Do the people that send you these fabrics get to see the final piece that contains their fabrics? I would love to say yes, um, but I get sent so much fabric that I do sometimes forget who exactly sends it to me. And mm -hmm. um, But I do show all my work, so hopefully they can recognize the fabric they gave me. Yeah, I'm sure that's that's very special. Now, now talking about the work that you do, one of your favorite techniques is meandering quilting. Um, you also talk about painting with fabric and thread. So tell us more about meandering. What is it? And how do you paint with fabric and thread? So meandering, I learned about the word through the quilting context. And that context is it's actually a quilt pattern. It's basically the way I think about it is you just quilt and you never run and overlap the quilt, the stitching. And then I, as I was working on my show, which is titled Meandering Thoughts, I was thinking about the duality of the work, how, I mean, the word, where it means as well of like, traveling, um, like going through something, but never really coming to an end and never really like overlapping each other. Exactly what the quilting context was. And when I'm making work, I use the fabric as like the broad paint stroke, right? And then the stitching is like the very intimate like detailing work on it so it's like you have the paint of the fabric and then you have the paint brush of the stitching and i have started to gravitate towards filling in like a lot of wide spaces or with this meandering stitching because one it just looks beautiful and then two it's like this almost therapeutic meditative process where I'm just filling it in and thinking about whatever, maybe the piece, maybe something else. But then I realized that's more how my brain works. It's not thinking about something of a destination. It's all about the journey and the journeys never end. Michael, when you were in college, did you sew or quilt during that time? Funny enough is no, I didn't. Um, in college, I was a basketball player. Um, and for all four years, so that took up the primary time in my uh, for my days. And then I was still just dipping into art, just getting my feet wet. And that's when I started picking up photography. And that's when I started to understand like the foundations of how I see the world. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until post college, a couple of years after post college, that I ended up picking back up quilting. And you mentioned before how grateful you were to be able to live your life on on your art, that this is your your thing now, that um that you can do this to fully support yourself. Yeah, it's a wild experience. I mean, I still I still can't wrap my head around it because even talking to you today, I am three days away from my first solo gallery show and just understanding that like this podcast is a part of my job. Like it's just my job, quote unquote, just looks so vastly different. And I can't lie. It's super fun. Tell us more about this, uh, the show that's coming up in two days. So this show um, coming up in on Thursday, April 15th, I believe, is my first gallery show, solo show. And it was so interesting going through the process of that, you know, when the show 
last year in 2020 was kind of just a culmination of all my work in my house. Like it just it didn't know rhyme or reason. If it was in the house, I just put it in the show. But this one was much more thought out. And it was so funny because initially I was thinking about this. I wanted to make this super intellectual show and blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, took a step back to remind myself like who I was when I talk about art. I don't talk about a bunch of theory. I don't talk about a bunch of like academic stuff because I think that is really inaccessible for a lot of people. Most of the people who come to enjoy my art, not that I don't love that aspect of art and um, indulge in that. I just think when I speak about art, I like to make it more accessible. And so then I started thinking about what do I want to do? Like, what do I want the show to be? And I just thought of, I don't know how, I don't remember exactly the circumstances that this came to mind, but then I thought of the fact that in living in New York as a working artist without doing anything else, I was living my wildest dream. And so with that idea, I was like, you know, it'd be really cool if I made a show about my new wildest dreams. Because I think it's so interesting now that I have the freedom to not have to be restricted to working at a certain place for a certain amount of hours. I'm allowed to dream. And I think it's so interesting when you think about the arc of life when you're young, people tell you to dream, be whatever. But then there's that breaking point where you people are like, well, you got to get a job. You got to support yourself. You got to support your family. And then people slowly but sadly stop dreaming because the reality is setting in and they got to make something. They got to do something that's actually going to bring money in. And so that's really the premise of the show. And so each piece is talking about a new wildest dream. So Michael, what's next for you? That's a great question. Um, Cause that's like, I'm at the press. I'm at the precipice of my art career. You know, I have in this first show and now I really do think that I have a love and so much to give into quilting, but I also think about what do I want to do more into my art practice? You know, I don't want to just be known as a quilt artist. I think this summer, for sure, I'm going to expand my art practice into other mediums. And the beauty of that is I don't know what the mediums are yet. I don't know what the new art is going to look like. But that's something that I really want to do because I think of like the the most famous, famous artists like Picasso, he did it all, no matter the medium. I mean, he was his paintings were like the top tier in his art practice. And that's how I kind of look at my quilting, where I have this thing that nobody can take from me. And that's solidified. Like I love that. I'm gonna always keep pushing that. But now that I have this excitement and this energy and this like new world to work with, I think about what else can I do? So like, I think about at my next shows and next, next shows, it's going to be more of a like multidisciplinary show. And like, hopefully if I do it right. I would love to have a show where it almost feels like there's 15 artists, but it's all my work. We'll be looking for amazing things to come from you in the future. Now, when I, when I end these podcasts, I always ask, was there a question I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Um, yeah, no, I was thinking about that um, before, and I don't think so. Because uh, this is like a great, like, it's so funny thinking about like the one, this is my first podcast, so I can't think about that. But the interviews I've done, and it's really, they really fall into one or two buckets. It's either the basketball player turned art bucket, or it's the art bucket. And mm -hmm. none of them really know what quilting is. And so it's super fun to just have a conversation about Pri the primary focus about the conversation being quilting. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was like amazing that I haven't actually experienced yet. Well, it seems like there are going to be many first experiences coming your way. Michael, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I want to thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. 
If any of our listeners would like to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do so? They can find me at michaelcthorpe.com. And all the information you need to reach out to me, my gallery is provided there. Excellent. Michael, thank you again for joining us. It's been wonderful talking to you today. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day, Meg. Well, there you have it. Another story about someone just like you, someone for whom quilting is so much more than a hobby. It's a way of life. It's a connection to something bigger. If you know someone you think has an outstanding story, a story that should be shared on this podcast, please drop me a note to megoodman at theflintrock.com and put you should hear their story in the subject line. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform and visit our website, soandsopodcast.com, for more information about today's and all of our guests. That's S-E-W-A-N-D-S-O podcast.com. I also want to thank Bernina for making this program possible. I'm Meg Goodman, and I look forward to you joining us next time on So-and-So. So-and-so.